Hey guys, welcome to a new video, uh, the first video about Heroes Adventure The Great Conquest. This is the new DLC which has just dropped for Heroes Adventure. And well, I've played one full run now, I started another, so let's talk a bit about it. The idea with the game is you are positioned on this large map. In this case you have your sect. Now, big downside, you cannot create your own sect, you can only start with one of the existing sects. So, well, we can take a look at that as well. If you start a new game, you can only pick one of these sects. They each have different abilities, different manuals, different traits, but you cannot create your own one, which is something I do not like. It's what I hoped for, that you can start as a random nobody in, I don't know, this province down here and then slowly encroach on, uh, upon the lands of the other sects, establish yourself, but sadly does not happen. Instead you only can pick with one of these predetermined options. And in fact, if you look at it, for example, Melody House, we have Fu Yao Chin, but you cannot find the other two girls. So there's only like the main sect leader and then random disciples. Okay, this one does have two main characters, but even like the Ye family, you don't see Ye Yinping for... What else do we have? Divine Flame sect, you only have the main guy. Here I think we have two. A lot of characters are missing. And well, once you are playing your game, you have all kinds of resources, you manage typical money, mediation points, food, minerals, herbs and wood. And you basically need them for every action. So for example, if I want to attack, okay, we need to go to the next month. Basically, every disciple in your sect will get one action per month. That action can be learning a new martial art, going on an event, attacking someone, and so on. And once you have used your actions, or in case you do not want to use your actions, you go to the next month and the action points reset. Now in my case, of course, I'm playing the Tiger Escort right now with these four provinces, let's call them. Well, here you could see the border though. Some colors are harder to detect, like some colors like green, I can easily see right at the glance where the border is, but sometimes it gets hard. And big downside to this game mode, if you've ever played something like Crusader Kings, like a Paradox game, you cannot zoom out. I can use my scroll wheel however much I like, however I cannot zoom out. There is a spacebar shortcuts to get back to your own place again, but I cannot zoom out and it's so annoying. The best option would be going to Diplomacy and then seeing the different factions, but yeah. Um, this game, I'll tell you right away, is not really perfected. One of the biggest issues right now is, for example, uh, in the base game, legendary attacks are the best, like by far the best attacks. In this game, blue attacks are the best. Why? In a normal game, legendary attacks can be used right away at the start of combat, however, have a three turn cooldown. And well, um, epic stuff will have a two turn cooldown. In this game mode, right at the start of combat, you cannot use your moves, and legendary moves have a three turn cooldown, epic moves a two turn cooldown. So if you imagine the usual setup like 50-50, two legendary attacks, two legendary internals, you cannot act for the three first turns besides the basic attack. Furthermore, the legendary effects the manuals offer are not that incredible. If you, like you can even look at this tree, we'll go over it in a moment, look at like one plate, it gives you 10% attack increase, some crits and that's it. Whereas the normal moves, yes, they deal more power, but power is even underwhelming in this game. So typically your best setup for your characters, and well, that's another thing is, every manual you have does not increase your attack like every offensive. So the best setup is one blue move and the rest internals. And yes, Arc Demon Soul Eating Skill is the best internal once more. Uh, yes. That feels very underwhelming. Uh, 
I guess let's just go over the planning tree. The idea is you have a skill tree you can invest points in and you get some benefits. For example, you gain some materials every return and you can upgrade it. You can unlock different traits for your sect, different martial arts. You can boost the if efficacy of learning, you can reduce the cost of attacking, increase the sight limit and so on. It's kind of cool that you progressively unlock the whole sect, however, meditation is the biggest downside to it all. If you are lucky and yet like someone with 10 intelligence, you would get I think like 300 meditation points per round, at like maximum upgrade. Currently I get 150 for 6, which is like 25, I think, 25 per stat. So 250 maybe with a 10 intelligence guy. And if you look at 3, 300 points, 500 points, 800 points, and you can only meditate once per month. It is so insanely... Oh. I don't even know how to describe it. It's such a chore to get anywhere with these different points. Then, of course, you can notice some of these things are not capitalized, which tells me it's... To be honest, chat GPT translation is better than that. Some of this is underwhelming. But let's go through what you can do. Um, you have attack. Basically, you can attack. You click on a position where you are at and then you can attack a foreign location you can see who they are and then will attack if you win you get the uh, piece of land but expect even if they are currently fighting which is kind of cool that you see it they are going to go out in full force against you and well if you get a piece of land you get some like resources per month and if you manage to destroy the headquarters of a sect, you completely destroy the sect. So for example, if I were to attack the Ye family battalion, or the Taos sect main quarters, or the Melody house, I could completely annihilate their sect. Next thing we have is healing. So if someone is damaged, you can heal them, which does cost especially a lot of herbs. Herbs is kind of hard to obtain. And it wastes their actions, which is very problematic. If you play the game you can get into a situation where you have to heal your people because well they are too damaged, thus you pass a turn. In response the enemy attacks again, damages your people. Now you have less resources than before, are still damaged, now you have to somehow get more herbs again to heal and you fall into this like cycle where you cannot progress any further. Next up we've learned the idea is you can improve the XP of your moves, but as you can see out of 200 XP you get 30 currently. If you upgrade the skill tree a bit this goes up to 51. So you need to pass 4 months to get a blue skill higher up, which is, wow, incredible. A waste of time most likely. Uh, mediation, or the meditation rather, is very essential, you need those points they should buff it or at least allow us to send multiple disciples to meditation yeah next up grasping kind of important you can learn move basically i can t uh, tell him he should learn the armor breaker blade but as i mentioned it's not worth learning multiple attacks currently one blue attack rest in turns is the sweet spot so i don't even need to bother and while well, you or unlock more manuals via your planning tree and sometimes you can buy them or obtain them from events. Benefit. This was not even explained in the tutorial, which is, it just shows how complete the tutorial is. The idea is if you've played like Crusader Kings 3 for example, each county had a control stat, depending on the control stat you got taxes and levies from it. It's essentially the same. If a position is very stable, you get all the output from it. If the stability reduces, you get less output, and well, this would increase the stability, but yeah, you waste a turn for it. Supply. Um, you'd actually first have to unlock in the lovely skill tree somewhere, I don't even know, 
unlock garrison disciple. The idea is you can send some of your disciples to, um, okay, not your disciples, but extra disciples to protect those different places so that when an enemy would attack, you have like an additional meat body to help you out. Very underwhelming. And supply would allow you to recover them, but you waste your main disciples action, so it's not worth it. Then events, there are different events you can obtain. They have a duration, how long they stay here for, and a limit of how many people can go. This is actually kind of cool, that it feels a bit more interactive and everything. Just like in Crusader Kings 3, when you get different events and stuff happens. Uh, next up, the bottom things, like info, I can look at my character, see how she is. By the way, level 10 is the maximum in the game. And yeah, now a lot of these traits, I don't know if I have a good example, are AI translated. You can see it right away, we have some really bad cases where I have no clue what it even talks about. Furthermore, you cannot increase the base stats really. Yeah, you cannot increase them at all, in fact. And the played stats, this is hilarious. In the base game, these are really easy to increase, even by learning manuals. In this game, you cannot really increase them outside of accessories. And they are mandatory to equip certain equipment. Like a legendary plate would need 9 plates that. And it's possible that a random disciple, okay, I selected the ones which actually have at least 9. A disciple can have just 8, which means he could never wear legendary weapons. Next up, recruiting. You can recruit characters. Do we have a good case now? Um, typically, you just want to look at attack power and... Okay, at first you want to find someone with high int to get more meditation points. Then you want to find someone with good attack power. And typically, high attack power comes via traits like attack increase. That's the early game portion. And when you get to like the mid and late game portion, you can actually recruit some named characters. For example, you could recruit Fu Yao Chin if the Melody House is obliterated, annihilated, and those are going those are going to be your main damage output. Those random outer or in this case unnamed disciples, your normal basic skin are really bad in comparison to the later ones. And well here we are in my first run where I even conquered the whole world just this one portion left which I'm about to do now and I have a lot of named people so your typical people from the story they are a lot stronger than your random disciples with the sect outfit and that's typically what you want to do in the mid to late game recruit those a lot of them you can even get via events for example all four of them I can recruit via events and well these you can recruit via tokens but yeah also, fun fact, Chu Kuang Chen, old demon. At some point in the game, there is a youth martial arts tournament. Basically, the young stars can fight against each other. Old demon actually participates in that. And he always wins. In every attempt I've had, he always wins. He has such ridiculous stats. Very balanced. Um, well, we can now continue on. By the way, here you can see a few more. If you increase your planning tree, you can unlock more people at once. Now, next up, we get to managing people. You can increase, if they are an outer disciple, we better go back to the other, not that, other save file. If you have outer disciples, like here, you could promote them to inner disciples, which increases their level cap, and that's it. I think normally it's like level 8. As an inner disciple, they can become level 10. Amazing. Truly incredible mechanic. I have never seen something like that. They could have also just written down increase level cap. And that's it. That's all it does. By the way, since we're talking about recruiting and managing, one big caveat of this game is also the disciple limit. At first it's like 4, with a maxed out sect it's 10. If you have 11 disciples, all your characters will get a big moot hit. 
and well mood you can see in via this heart it's how well they are feeling if it drops too low they do not want to do anything and skip their turns so you always want to keep it up so if you for example have 15 out of 10 disciples in the end none of your characters can ever act and let's be honest 10 characters in a sect is so underwhelming you're supposed to be a big sect and then you're limited to 10 characters god damn uh, planning we already talked about it just requires way too many meditation points and even all these resources is way too freaking much now trading you first have to unlock a merchant via planning and this is one of the things you should do right away and then well you can trade with them the coin merchant takes coins gives you the other resources food merchant takes food gives you the other resources and so on basic stuff and you can even unlock later on an equipment merchant expand their goods and then the nameless merchant the nameless merchant provides some of the strongest accessories an equipment merchant with a second expansion provides legendary gear yeah so you want to slowly but surely head there next up trades you can basically give your disciples trades it's similar to the character menu like when you start a character in the base game you get uh, ha half points and you can allocate it but first let me take a selfie now um but first you have to unlock them and they are tied to your sect so depending on the sect you only get specific ones for example here plus one strength 10 percent attack boost 10 percent crit boost 10 percent parry boost uh, main attribute of armor is increased by 30% and then the two strong ones which is 50% chance to deal double damage and another action of the killing an enemy but just look at how many meditation points it would take and if you unlock those you get several copies of it so some of your disciples can just get it and of course the higher the level of the disciple is the more points you will have and they also have innate traits, which I'm sure you've seen from the recruit menu. They have some traits they start with. Um, items. Basic stuff. Equip your characters with items. And this is kind of what you want to collect later on, but the game tells you about it as well. And then the worst feature in the whole freaking game. Diplomacy. The idea is you can contact other sects and then make friends with them by for example gifting them some items like an opal or some money and if their relation increases you can trade with them if you trade with them just click this option you gain this much stuff per month the higher the opinion they have with you the more you get so in a sense it's free resources the issue by the way is alliance and reconciliation and the way the game works with alliances. Alliances can be, I think, done at 60 or 50 opinion. And what it means is if, what, okay, what do we have here? If the Abology sect is attacked by the Zhoujiang fortress and I am allied with the Abology sect, I can help out the Abology sect in the fight. However, if let's say I'm allied with the water camp, and the uh, Langya Pavilion attacks. I literally cannot physically move over from my Tiger Escort squad, uh, position to this fight over here to intervene. So I cannot help out. What it means is I and my ally both have to be adjacent to the enemy, which is really rare, especially if you do diplomacy on a larger scale. That's the first issue. The second issue is relation randomly spikes and we don't know why. There are cases, for example, the blue wind camp I had at plus 50 relation, suddenly they are at minus 20. Now what we also figured out is, amusingly enough, with alliances. Let's imagine I, as the tiger escort, am allied to the melody house in a beast manner. And the beast manner attacks melody house. All my alliances with those two will break. Next amusing situation. 
I am allied with the Beast Manor and Melody House. Melody House themselves are allied to the Jolly Tribe. Now the Beast Manor, which well, via Link is allied with me, I am allied with Melody House. That's like the direct and indirect connection. And then the third degree would be a relation with the Jolly Tribe through Melody House. But obviously you don't consider that. If Beast Manor now attacks Jolly Tribe, my alliance with the Melody House will break. Because my ally now attacked my ally's ally, breaking the alliance. And obviously there will be some negative uh, relation malice as well due to alliances being broken. Incredible. Incredible. And then next amusing thing is there's reconciliation. The idea is when the sect relation drops too low, you can pay some money to make it neutral again. Essentially what the Lin Lang Temple Guy did in the base game. Now let's imagine my relation with the Blue Wind Camp dropped to like minus 80 and they decide to attack my terrain. Now I were to go ahead and reconcile with them by paying a sum of money, like reparation money, they still will not stop their attack. You have paid money to them, you have made peace with them, but they still will not stop their attack. Okay, amazing as well. Then the next amazing thing about uh, alliances as well is, if I'm allied to the Taoist sect, I can still attack the Taoist sect. Yes, the Taoist sect will not like me anymore, but that's all there is in terms of penalty. There's nothing for like breaking a treaty, a truce, there isn't even something like a truce, but well, a treaty. I can just attack them. Why can I just attack them if I'm in an alliance with them? I don't know. Um, yes. Then the next thing. No events can max on them. I don't have it right now. Already taken. I see, I see. Next thing, there is a big problem with certain events, which is your typical once a month send out your disciples to get some experience event, which is exactly this one. Now I'm level 9 with my main character and 5 with like the others. What do you think I could pick in terms of difficulty? The answer is reliably only D. Why? First of all, you have to skip a lot. You get an encounter. And by the way, this is also hilarious with the XP, if we look at it. Sudali actually defeated the enemy. He gains 26. Everyone else gets 1 EXP. That's why my main character is level 9. The others are 5, or 4, or 2. Because my main character is strong, as such he continues getting the kills, and the other characters cannot level up. Amazing. But now, the best part about this going out for experiences, it is random when it stops. I had 6 subsequent fights, back to back, which gets stronger and stronger, and you cannot quit in the middle. Your character randomly decides at some point when they want to return. And if you get unlucky, it keeps going and going until all your characters are fainted and then you have fun healing them first. Because it can even be some like three people die, then your strong sect leader keeps getting involved with the fights. Like once more and another fight. I do not have the option to quit at some point. And like you see it, my main character is so strong she kills one of those like snakes or scorpions right away. As such she gets most of the XP. And the only way I can reliably level up the other guys is if I don't send her along. But that risks us fainting. And it's like this devious cycle of not really being able to do anything. And by the way, for blue moves, pay attention that you get some AoE. Now, if we get lucky, we can go home. If we don't get lucky, we would get involved in more fights. And like I said, I had six consecutive battles. Now, I once also talked about how healing with this option is trash, because it needs an action. 
what you really want to do in this game is stock up on healing items so that you can easily like use HP recovery tools to immediately heal up your people. Of course, it's expensive, but it's the best thing there is. 60% heal, perfect. But now, while I do hate these events, the daily one or the monthly one where you go out against, like fight against random monsters, it's your best source of XP. It's where you get these combat techniques, which are like 30, then 50 and 100 XP each, depending on the difficulty, and you can use them to power level. Like I could use all of these. Okay, six is the max level for auto disciples. Okay, that's what I learned, not eight. I can use all these to power level people. The thing is, it would not be worth it to power level these random disciples, but only named people. So you typically want to stalk them up until you get some named people, but ah, it's a mess. Sorry. Now, what else can we talk about? What I also do not like is how the difficulty is, is scaled. Basically, if you pick someone, you have the different modes, easy, normal, hard, nightmare. On nightmare, all enemies just deal double damage and get double resources. Like This is fine in the mid to late game once you steamroll the opponent. However, in the early game, the enemy just crushes you. Because you need to do meditation to get any of your innovations unlocked. That means you pass some turns. Then in the early game there is a struggle to grab empty land to expand your territory. And well, one of the issues is, for example, this tile right here on my cursor's ad, or like these tiles are all, um, or do not belong to anyone. So if I'm playing the Tiger Escort, my first idea would be to grab all of these pieces of land. Now if the AI randomly decides, like the Ye Family Battalion, they at the first turn attack this and this tile, I am locked out of also going for those. I cannot even attack. I can't prevent their disciples from obtaining the land. I'm just completely locked out of actions with those tiles. And the AI always gets the first move. So if you're really unlucky, this is the only tile you could get as the Tiger Escort. Because Tower Sect, Melody House, Beast Manor, all decide to grab those. Blue Wind Cam, Ye Family Battalion grab those. You're left with one. And suddenly you struggle in the early game. Then furthermore, as I mentioned, diplomacy is a mess. Even if I increase my relation with the Tower Sect a bunch, which requires a lot of either luck with the gemstones or money, they could still attack me at any point. In the early game with double damage, the AI will steamroll you. So you need to hope that the AI simply does not attack. Very fun. Very freaking fun. Then furthermore, let's talk about some quests. In fact, once you get going a bit, defeat some sects, which is the ultimate goal to defeat like all other sects and rule this place, establish yourself, establish a rule, whatever, you unlock some treasures in the meanwhile. I have never been more disappointed in those treasures. If a legendary, uh, let's say, piece of armor we can even take a look at it. If a legendary piece of armor will grant 150 defense, this very strong treasure, like there was this whole build up for it, it's the strongest item there is. That's 280 defense, that's it. No other special modifier, just a higher base stat. If a normal weapon does 240 attack, this special insane legendary item which we forged out of three pieces we had to collect has the special effect of dealing 400 damage no extra effects nothing just higher base stats it feels so incredibly rewarding obtaining these items it's it's incredible by the way 
I once also talked about the nameless merchant you can obtain and how he has the strongest accessories. Yes. Just look at this ring. You can also take a look at this 200 tag. If I can close this menu, please. 50% more damage, 200 attack, 5 all stands. Yeah, you see. 20 action speed, there's even something else. Where even is that item? Uh, where is the last treasure item? There it is. This is the last treasure item. These are two of them. And there's the Shinzai file. I don't even know what this is supposed to do. I'm sorry, but this dragon ring is like 10 times stronger. Yes, amazing. Really love those quests. Also, by the way, in one of the last two events, you at first fight the Nameless Zero, like who has the skin of our main character in the base game. In the first battle, I one hit him which tells me my character was quite strong. In the second battle against him, it's a forced loss. Because the Nameless Hero is supposed to be the strongest character. As such, you have a guaranteed loss. How anticlimactic. Like, why do we obtain all those treasures, which are even his old pieces of equipment he had, and apparently he doesn't use them anymore, but instead lent them out. I don't know what the fuck happened. We have all of his equipment. And it's still a forced loss. Why? I don't know if you've played other Wuxia games, but I hate it. I freaking hate it whenever there's a forced loss. Just let me try at least. Because if I won it the first battle, you can't tell me suddenly the second battle I don't even stand a chance. Like, what kind of stupid power-up is that supposed to be? Yeah. Then also big issue with this game mode, I feel like there are no achievements. There's no achievement, conquer the whole world, there's no achievement, obtain all treasure pieces, obtain the first treasure piece, win in some random events, nothing. I get that they tried to not impact the base game, which is always the issue with releasing DLC. All bet I have to say at 2.99 this is a really cheap DLC, but yeah. I can see the issue behind it if you are forced to buy a DLC to unlock more achievements so your base story character gets stronger. But yeah, it feels very underwhelming. Like I've played this once and then like one and a half times essentially, but don't see me playing it again. I'll be completely honest. It just feels so empty. It just takes diplomacy alone. And by the way, they also force you or they prevent you from doing any diplomacy at a certain point. This will no longer engage in any diplomatic actions for you. You may think it's because they have minus 100 relation, but even at an earlier stage where they still had plus 40 or so, but we're completely surrounded, they no longer get involved in diplomacy with us because we are too much of a threat. Yeah. AKA how to force the player to actually conquer them without telling them they have to conquer it. Ah, here you can by the way see with stability how low it is. I could now benefit the people. Oh yeah, incredible. I pay like a hundred in everything, which is after all the discount discounts from planning, and I may get some back. Nice. It's just, it's a waste. I'd rather improve the strength of my second set. Oh. Okay, I think I've rambled on for long enough. I didn't have any concrete plans to go by. And I think you notice it with my rambling, but yeah. Those are my thoughts regarding the current game mode. It needs some changes, okay? Please change it, developers. 
Hope you enjoyed my rambling. Thanks for watching. See you next time.